the, uh, tonight's discussion is about the Abraham Accords. Um, it occurred to me that, that, that uh, you know, when these came out, I had deja vu all over again, like Yogi Berra said. The, the parallel was uh, with Israel's first peace treaty in 79 with, with Egypt, and then, uh, you know, the Sinai Accords that led up to that, uh, and then 94 with Jordan, and the one we probably all remember uh, or try not to remember in uh, uh, 95, the, the DOP, the Declaration of Principles, the, you know, the, the quote unquote uh, handshake on the White House lawn uh, where Rabin, talk about looking like he didn't wanna be there. Rabin and Arafat shook hands. If you remember Bill Clinton kind of moved them toward each other and, and uh, Yitzhak Rabin um, looked like, please God, get me out of here. Um, and many of us thought uh, or wished uh, that it was going to be the harbinger of a whole different era uh, that lasted a short while. But the 90s were, for good or for real, I think a bubble in a lot of ways internationally, not just uh, about the Middle East. So I, I have that in my mind. And, and maybe in the course of the night, it's interesting, I think, to parallel those movements toward peace. Um, with uh, the Abraham uh, Accords, which are movements toward peace with a small p. One of the criticisms, uh, and I, I hope I'll get to that on the Arab Street, is that they don't do what they're supposed to do. They're not bringing in peace uh, throughout the region or peace with the Palestinians. That's not, that was not actually their intention, at least as they were promulgated. Their intention was much more practical, much more pragmatic, much more lowercase, eventually, God willing, would lead to something. Uh, but unlike the, um, uh, the piece in the 90s, which everyone thought was going to be, you know, the door opener to a grand um, a regional piece, this was actually very different. So, so that's kind of the conceptual background. So let, let's um, uh, do a little uh, backtracking. The Abraham Accords. Um, it's, it's a series of treaties um, uh, normalizing diplomatic relations between Israel and, number one, the United Arab Emirates, UAE, number two, Bahrain, uh, number three, Sudan, and number four, Morocco. Uh, it was facilitated by the U.S. administration during the Trump administration between August and December of 2020. Um, in the span of five months, uh, those four Arab states joined Egypt and join Jordan um, in making peace with Israel. Uh, and it began with the, the UAE in August of 2020. And so a little bit about the UAE. Um, uh, United Arab Emirates is actually a confederation of seven emirates. It, it, it initially was six, then it was joined by seven. Uh, by seven. Um, the largest is Abu Dhabi, the capital of which is Dubai. Um, and um, the capital now of the, the whole federation, the UAE, is Abu Dhabi. It's supposed to be an amazing place. A very good friend of ours, Linda uh, <clears throat> Gradstein, and others uh, have visited. Uh, there's seven, I believe, kosher restaurants at last count in Abu Dhabi. It's a magnificent modern place with some issues, God knows. Um, uh, its economy is the fifth largest in, in the Middle East. Uh, the GDP is, as of last year, 500 billion a year. Its population is slightly under 10 million. But so the UAE and Israel have never fought militarily, and that's important. Uh, but the UAE did participate in the Arab League boycott against Israel, uh, which was actually in place since 48. Uh, remember, 48, there was armistice. There, there were not peace treaties. Uh, the Arab countries uh, that were defeated signed armistice agreements, uh, uh, non-aggression um, uh, treaties with um, um, agreements with, with Israel, but not a peace treaty. Um, so the basis of the agreement is primarily their shared um, uh, perception of Iran as a threat to both of them. Uh, but even before before they signed the uh, the um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me the agreement, uh, there were years of quiet and secret cooperation and diplomacy. Israel opened a, a 
uh, International Diplomatic Office in the UAE in 2015. Um, and the Mossad chief at the, uh, over the years made a number of quote unquote secret visits, but in the end weren't that secret um, uh, to Abu Dhabi. Both governments actually have cooperated in the last few years to fight the COVID pandemic. And both countries are interested in, in diversifying their economies and engaging with each other to make that happen. Um, to sweeten the deal, actually to make the deal happen, Israel uh, agreed to freeze its plans for annexation or the application of sovereignty in the West Bank as part of the deal. And the agreement has led to diplomatic ties and to cultural exchanges and grassroots cooperation between people. Since the agreement was signed, 130,000 Israelis, so not just Linda, who we know, 130,000 Israelis have visited Dubai alone, not just the rest of the Emirates. And trade between Israel and the UAE has reached a billion dollars a year. So here's the spillover effect. In, in grad school, we used to talk about spillover all the time, the stuff that will come after the first stuff. In June of 2022, UAE and Israel, not the other countries uh, in the Abraham Accords, but just the UAE and Israel signed a, a free trade agreement. It's first of its kind that Israel <clears throat> has ever signed with an Arab country. They don't even have one with Egypt or, or with Jordan. Um, the UAE praised the deal. It reduced tariffs on 96% of uh, goods and services for its potential to grow uh, sectors in environment, in energy, in digital services. And Israel said that the deal um, will uh, accelerate the trade of products like food and medicine. Um, the uh, UAE and Israel are predicting that the annual bilateral trade will reach $10 billion in five years. All of the, all already, a thousand Israeli companies are expected to open trade with Dubai at the end of this year. That's a huge, huge uh, game changer economically and, and, and I would say culturally as well and diplomatically. Um, to sweeten the deal on its side, the US agreed to sell advanced F-35 uh, fighters, uh, fighter jets to the UAE. Some Israeli security officials are concerned about that. They're worried that they could be turned around to be used against Israel in the future. Uh, Israel and DC supposedly have discussed this. Uh, I wasn't in the room, but there are public sources talking about that. And there seems to be an understanding that the US will supply Israel with defensive weapons if that happens. Okay, so that's the UAE, that was the first one. Uh, I'll go through the four really quickly and then we'll see if there's questions. Israel and Bahrain, announced a similar agreement in September of 2020. Yeah, Bahrain's teeny tiny, uh, less than one and a half million people. It initially signed a declaration of peace and it agreed to uh, normalizing diplomatic relations, negotiating a formal peace treaty, and <clears throat> this is such diplomatic language, not antagonizing each other. Similar to the UAE, uh, there had been long quiet and uh, long time and quiet uh, cooperation the King of Bahrain denounced the Arab League boycott of Israel in 2017. So not a long time ago, but before the Abraham Accords. In 2020, uh, Bahrain hosted a peace to prosperity conference led by the US and it was boycotted by Palestinian leaders. After the conference, the UAE and Bahrain announced together that they would cooperate with Israel to present a unified front to the United States about the Iranian nuclear threat and the Iranian ballistic missile program. And that's important because that wasn't even in the nuclear deal uh, that um, the Obama administration worked up about Iran. So the third country to sign the Abraham Accords was Sudan. Uh, Sudan signed a normalization agreement in October of 2020. Now Sudan's much larger. 45 million people, much, much, much poorer. The Gulf Cooperation Council countries like uh, Bahrain, the UAE, and Oman, and Saudi Arabia, uh, Kuwait, very, very wealthy. Sudan is not. Uh, Sudan is an economic basket case. Um, if you remember after 67, Sudan's capital, Khartoum, was the um, a place of the Arab League meeting after 67, where they came out with the famous three no's, no recognition, no peace, 
and no negotiation with Israel. So to have um, Sudan sign uh, an accord with Israel is just, you know, a, a ground shaking. Um, it's more complicated than the others because Sudan's government right now in the last year has been undergoing a um, transition, I would say, toward more democratization. Not full-fledged democracy, but far more than it had uh, before. So there's a challenge in the normalization agreement. First, it has to repeal a law still on the books that prohibits relations with Israel. So that gives you an idea where they were before. And the progress is slow because of opposition from some of the groups in Sudan. Uh, so why did Sudan sign anyway? Not, no one's doing this out of just um, altruistic love of, of Israel. Um, Sudan signed because President Trump removed Sudan from the list of the US countries uh, that promoted terrorism. Uh, so the US signed an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, to provide Sudan with a bridge loan to help it clear its uh, arrears to the World Bank and access a billion dollars in annual funding. Uh, and finally, the fourth country is Morocco. Morocco announced a normalization agreement in December of 2020. So all this happened really chit chop, boom, 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 like that. Uh, boom, 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 four. Uh, Morocco did have quiet diplomatic relations with Israel prior to normalization, different than the other countries. One is that we can, we probably all, many of us in the Jewish community know some Moroccan Jews. Morocco had a very long standing, um, culturally rich uh, Jewish community for, for centuries. Um, uh, most of them have left, like they did from the other Arab countries. The Moroccan government has made um, efforts to preserve uh, Jewish history and welcoming Moroccan Jews who visit the country. So why did Morocco sign? The US recognized under President Trump's administration, uh, Morocco's claim to disputed territory of Western Sahara. So this was very controversial at the time. It wasn't clear that the Biden administration would adopt the same stance, they didn't. In March of 2021, the US reversed its stance. This happened a lot, a lot, a lot after Biden came in after uh, the Trump administration. President Trump, um, he, his diplomacy was often through uh, Twitter. He tweeted to the King of Morocco uh, that he, the US, he would recognize Morocco's claim, uh, but it was essentially their position that they controlled disputed territory. Um, no one else in the world accepted them other than Morocco and then the Trump administration. The Trump administration position went more or less against international law. Morocco, it seems, has no legal standing, no claim of sovereignty over Western Sahara. Uh, it was essentially a non-financial bribe <clears throat> for Morocco to accept the Abraham Accords. Uh, and Trump used the words himself. He called it transactional diplomacy. It's not about interests. It's about what I'm going to get out of it. And you, you know, you can make the point that, well, that's the real world, that's real politique. Um, many other countries talk about longstanding values and alliances, and President Trump saw it as transactional diplomacy. So um, that's partly why they, they signed. Um, different than the other countries, by the way, uh, different than the, the UAE and Bahrain, Morocco and the Sudan have far less worry about Iran because they're not um, you know, in, in their sphere as the Gulf states are. So the previous administration uh, position about Western Sahara, there was bipartisan support for not recognizing uh, Moroccan sovereignty over Western Sahara. President Trump kind of overturned that. Um, and then in the end, when the Biden administration came and overturned the overturning, uh, there is bipartisan support of that. Um, so that's, so let me pause because then I want to talk about how do the Palestinians see this, how the Americans see this, uh, and the benefits of the Accords, the challenges of the Accord, and where do we go from here? But now let me see if there's questions just about this. Sheila. Today, I was just reading in um, New York Times, uh, UAE has allowed Israelis uh, flights from Israel direct 
to Dubai for the world soccer mm -hmm. something. And, and those of you who have been involved, you know, I, uh, professionally, personally, institutionally, uh, communally with uh, Israel and the Middle East, these are, these are the things that we look at our younger children and say, you guys, you have no clue how big of a deal this is. It, it's just, uh, you know, and, and other people who don't focus on the Middle East or on Israel or uh, Arab-Israeli issues, they say, yeah, 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 big deal, a plane going this way or that way. It's extraordinary. It's just, it's just mind blowing to think that there are cultural attaches, diplomatic relations, a plane going over Saudi airspace to another Arab country, 130,000 Israelis visiting Dubai. So all those things are really game changers in so many ways. And that, that was one of them. Uh, yeah, David. So I, I guess I have three things. One of them I hope is very simple, which is uh, uh, what would be the Western and or English equivalent if there is such a thing of an emir? Because I've always, I mean, I understand what the United Arab Emirates is in a very general vague way, but I, I don't know what an emir is per se, vis-a-vis -a, -vis a king or whatever. Yeah, uh, so, so in some of them, it's almost like a prime minister to the king in a constitutional monarchy where the king does have power, but is shared somewhat with the vizier or the prime minister. But a lot of it's cultural. Uh, so so the, uh, the emir in one of the emirates is different than they used to uh, have uh, uh, the title emir even in, the, in, the, in Saudi Arabia. So it, it depends about the history of the place. Okay, so it's a little more complicated. Then the, the middle is the Middle East. Wait, fair fair East. enough. <laughs> <laughs> then the the what I thought would be the more complicated questions. Uh, one is uh, how much of this do you think is really about the uh, reality that the Sunni states are interested in Israel as a partner against Iran? as opposed to anything particularly warmer than that, on the one hand. And on the other hand, do, do these uh, economic ties imply that maybe it could become warmer in the future, whatever the, even, even if it is motivated by both sides wanting to re resist Iran? Um, so, so, in the in the broad sphere, in the concentric circles of the Middle East, uh, the contiguous uh, uh, neighboring Arab states, uh, they have more of a problem with Israel. They fought wars, they've lost wars. That's an issue. Their governments have been taken over by, by uh, we used to call them terrible, you know, single bullet regimes. One bullet, and there's a change in the regime. Um, as you go to the outer circle, like the Gulf states of the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council, um, and then even further into Africa, um, they have less of a problem um, uh, with, with Israel and therefore, most of the time, less worry about Iran. So if you talk about the UAE and um, Bahrain and uh, uh, Kuwait, of course, and of course, Saudi Arabia, you know, they're, they're genuinely worried about Iran for genuine reasons. So for them, Israel is a bulwark. I mean, everyone, I, I, I know, but ju just to make sure that we don't uh, assume anything, um, uh, the Sunni and, and Shia um, uh, um, split in, in uh, the Muslim world. Uh, it's about 85, 15. There are more Sunni, it actually means majority uh, than, than Shia, than the opposition. Um, but Iran is primarily uh, Shia, from say Shiite. Um, they're not just political rivals, they are cultural rivals, they are theological rivals. So the Saudis and the Iranians, uh, there's no love lost. And they're, they're the twin pillars, you know, the, the largest, the most populous uh, Muslim country in the world is Indonesia, outside of the Middle East, right? But within the Middle East, 
the two um, uh, poles of uh, the Islamic world are uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran. Uh, they jockey for position. They fought proxy wars in Yemen. Uh, there's no love lost between the Ayatollah and the king, between the Ayatollah Khomeini in, 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 in uh, Iran and uh, the king, or really uh, Muhammad bin Salman, MBS, the de facto king in, in Saudi Arabia. So they're really, they, they are genuinely worried about the Iranian threat and they've come to their senses, I, I think, that uh, so is Israel. The joining force of Israel is really smart. The ones who never had historic issues with Israel, like Syria, like Lebanon, uh, like, like Egypt, uh, like Jordan, the other ones like the UAE and like Bahrain and, and Kuwait, um, Saudi Arabia is in a different category. It's easier for them <clears throat> to have good relations. So they've had quiet relations with Israel or not hostile relations for years and years and years. They, I think, a long way to get to the question, they, I think, are intending um, a warmer relation than just a cold peace. Um, the trade balance, the cultural ties, um, kosher restaurants in Dubai, those kind of things. Morocco has had a long-standing Jewish community. So there are countries in the broader Middle East that one can't stand Iran, the Sunni countries, and two, aren't they don't have a history of warfare with Israel. So uh, some of them are doing it just practically. And some others, it's a combination of both, which I think could lead to something far greater. Not too many Dubai citizens have visited Israel yet. Just like the same thing after the Egyptian Sinai Accord, uh, peace accord, many Israelis went to Egypt, very, very few Egyptians went to Israel. That's still the same uh, same thing with Jordan. Israel um, Israelis need uh, you know space to move. After the Sinai was returned, uh, a lot of Israelis felt this psychic. Where do we go now? We, we live in such a small sliver. So they love for those reasons and for cultural and historical reasons to go to Jordan, to go to Egypt if it's safe or even relatively safe. Um, so a lot of Israelis have gone all over the place. I think the Gulf Cooperation Council uh, citizens will start visiting Israel. Um, there, there are ties that look to be um, stronger than they ever were with each of them with Jordan. Uh, other questions? Hey, uh, yeah, yeah, Sheila. If there's anybody else, they can go first. All right. Um, I think you have this mentioned somewhere that you wanted to discuss it, but if Syria and Lebanon were to make peace with Israel, how would that turn out? In other words, they could then kick out Hezbollah, kick out all the others. There is some sort of quiet um, between Syria and Israel that had to do with, that's why Israel didn't bother with Ukraine, isn't bothering with Ukraine because they're afraid of Russia. But they right. so, then- So let's, let's separate them out. Lebanon is barely a, a, a genuine country anymore. Uh, there is a that's, sense. Yeah, remember, people used to call Beirut the Paris of the Middle East. Yeah. Uh, and then they had a 15 year civil war and, and destroyed. Uh, it's just awful. Uh, Lebanon has this really complicated constitution where the, the president and the prime minister and the speaker of the parliament all come from different sectarian backgrounds uh, Muslim, Druze, and Maronite Christian in that order. It's just really um, uh, a, a balancing act, a, a puzzle on a, on a, a teetering board, a teeter board, teeter teeter totter. <laughs> um, uh, so very complicated. Now it's nearly completely um, uh, uh, taken over by Hezbollah. Uh, oh, Hezbollah, by the way, should, means party of God. Uh, his in Arabic is party Allah God. So Hezbollah, if you see that or hear that, it literally means party of God. Um, uh, so, and it's in, and it's a proxy, even though it's primarily Sunni, uh, it's a proxy of Iran. Iran has supplied nearly all of its um, weapons, all of its missiles, it used to be katushas, you know, which were poorly aimed, now far more deadly, far more accurate. So peace with Lebanon, 
in theory is possible. The maritime agreement that was just signed was amazing. It was another step toward normalizing uh, relations, even though it wasn't a peace accord. Uh, Hezbollah agreed because the Lebanese people were really hurting, hurting, hurting with nearly no energy during the night, uh, you know, an hour literally of, uh, uh, of electricity uh, every night, food difficult. So Hezbollah, like all, even all despots has to worry about the street rising up against them. So they grudgingly went along with the maritime agreement. Syria, really no love lost between the Syrians and the Israelis. Uh, I worked with a Shalia who was a tank commander uh, in, in Sinai. Um, and he, he used to say representative, a lot of people his age, a little bit older than I am now. Um, uh, you know, we fought hard against the Egyptians. They were the, the toughest and the strongest and the biggest uh, Arab army but they were honorable. Yeah, there were violations, but they were honorable. The Syrians, when we uh, captured the Golan, we found our boys with their hands tied behind their backs, shot through their head. Uh, so that those memories linger long. I can't even imagine after Assad, uh, whether Hafsad uh, uh, al-Assad or his son Bashir, um, real peace in, with Syria, not for a long, long time. Um, but conceivably with Lebanon, if they, if they do what was done to the PLO, if they rise up against Hezbollah, maybe. Let me go back to the Accords a little bit. Um, um, the Palestinians, by the way, no surprise, uh, have strongly condemned the, uh, the Abraham Accords. Um, the Palestinian Authority, the, the PA called, uh, called it a total betrayal uh, and attacked the UAE when it was the first country to sign. Uh, Hamas also reacted as expected. Hamas also is fully funded by Iran in, in the South, <clears throat> in, in, in Gaza. Hamas uh, said that the agreement served the Zionist narrative and that Arab states should continue to engage in anti-normalization. Those statements actually led to a backlash uh, in the Arab world including a very lengthy, I just reread it for like the third time, uh, interview by a former Saudi ambassador to the US, Prince uh, Bandar Bil Sultan, uh, leveling unprecedented, harsh, harsh uh, public criticism against the Palestinian uh, leadership. Uh, he, um, uh, he called out the, the, uh, the PA, he called out Mahmoud Abbas, um, never, ever, ever would have done something like this before. They were very tight in support of the Palestinian people and the Palestinian leadership. That never happened during Yasser Arafat's time. And in the beginning, not with Mahmoud Abbas either, also called Abu Mazen. Um, according to a poll by the Palestinian Center for Policy and, and Survey Research, 80% of Palestinians describe their feelings toward the Abrahamic Accords as treason, abandonment, an insult. Dennis Ross, longtime mediator uh, in, the, in the Middle East, uh, former peace envoy for, for Washington, wrote that the UAE's move should also signal to the Palestinians that others are not going to wait for them to make peace with Israel. So, so the broad scheme of things, the strategy in the uh, Arab world, uh, and to some extent the larger Muslim world, was that um, the Palestinians. First, it was Arab states making peace with Israel, state to state. Then 67 turned that on its head, 73 really did. And then the PLO became <clears throat> more and more important and Arafat more important on the, on the uh, uh, international stage. And then it was all about the Palestinians being front and center. After the Declaration of Principles fell apart after not in the 90s, uh, the second Intifada, when Debbie and Josh and Nomi and I were living in Israel during those years, um, uh, most Israelis said, it's not going to happen. Making peace with the Palestinians, not going to happen. We're going to go back to state to state. And, and even though the Arab states paid lip service to the Palestinians, less and less were they interested or certainly not enthusiastic about going that route. They are more concerned with their own people, their economies, um, starting to get more concerned about Iran. So then it went back state to state. 
uh, and, and I think Dennis Ross said it right, that the Arab states are not going to wait forever for the Palestinian leadership to say, okay, we're ready. Um, Hamas and Hezbollah are not loved, forget about from Israelis, of course, they're not loved in the Arab or the Muslim world either, that the revolutionaries are saying, yay team, there's fewer and fewer of them, the PFLP, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, the DFLP, the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine, those guys, uh, uh, Abu Midal, uh, they are a former, former shadow of themselves, still around, still in the memories, the, you know, the old guard is much older than they used to be, the, the state leaders, the uh, nation state leaders have different things on their mind. So other Arab and Muslim states like Oman, uh, Indonesia, Saudi Arabia are now starting to consider normalization with Israel now uh, as well. So where are we now? <clears throat> I, I took a look at a, uh, an article from a couple of years ago from the Middle East Institute. The Middle East, East Institute, some of you are familiar with it, is purportedly, quote, neutral. Of course, there's no such thing in the world, and certainly not when it comes to the Middle East. Uh, it's where I studied Arabic for a teeny tiny amount of time uh, after grad school, and also where I forgot most of my Arabic. Um, it's certainly Arab leaning, kind of like Georgetown is neutral, but it's really not in its uh, um, international uh, uh, relations uh, <clears throat> discipline. Um, they even said that the positives of the normalization agreements are they're opening up new opportunities for defense and security cooperation, primarily from the common perception of a threat from Iran. And there is a subsequent agreement to organize what's called the Negev Forum. We didn't talk about that. That's a really amazing outgrowth from the Abraham Accords. What the Negev uh, Forum did was fold Egypt into the coalition of uh, Abraham Accord countries. Uh, Egypt had its own peace uh, treaty with Israel, uh, a full-fledged peace treaty, but it's been a cold peace uh, all this time and, you know, tension back and forth. The Negev Forum allowed Egypt to hang with um, the UAE and Bahrain and Sudan and Morocco and Israel um, about cooperating on shared interests, including energy and food and water security and health. So that's huge. So the Middle East Institute said, okay, those are the positives, the negatives. The shortcomings, cooperation between Arab uh, uh, participants and Israel failed to produce tangible improvements in Israeli-Palestinian relations. So they're kind of the old guard that's still looking at this as it's an Israeli-Palestinian thing. Um, I, and I would never uh, suggest that the Israeli-Palestinian issue or conundrum isn't um, a puzzle and a problem and a challenge, of course. Uh, it is one part of the larger Arab-Israeli issue, which is one part of the complicated Middle East issue, which is one part of the larger global issue. So there are many, many issues uh, in the Middle East that have nothing to do with Palestine, Palestinians or Israeli-Palestinian issues. Um, Saudis and, uh, and Iranians. Uh, oil issues, water issues, uh, women issues. Um, there are a lot of things that don't have to do with uh, Yudah and Shomron or the West Bank and Gaza or Mahmoud Abbas. So it's clearly a part of the puzzle and has, I think has to be addressed, but it's not the sole issue. So when, when the Middle East Institute or other play, players on the international stage say, you know, the central, central issue, the most important issue, I, you have to you have to put that in a larger context. Um, it is a legitimate question to ask: Was it was it a goal of the Arab nations uh, to produce tangible improvements in Palestinian-Israeli uh, relations, or was that just paraded PR for the Arab street? They had to cover themselves. They had to do something when they said, "Well, we're going to enter into this incredibly." a um, uh, new agreement, powerful agreement with Israel. Uh, oh, we're doing it for our Palestinian brothers and sisters. That, that's fine. I think there was a lot of that. Um, but if you look, I mean, even public source stuff, if you look at how uh, Arab state leaders are talking about the Palestinians, we've bled for you, we've died for you, 
it would cost us treasure for you. Egypt certainly has said that. They are not, uh, you know, the, the flag wavers for the Palestinian cause like they used to be. Maybe they never were, but now it's a lot more out in the open. Um, the negative forum, this new attachment, new addendum to the uh, Abraham Accords might change things because it's brought Egypt, still the largest powerful, uh, in one sense, still one of the most important Arab countries into the coalition. The other shortcomings from the Middle East Institute's perspective and other countries in the world's perspective, there's a failure to bring in new members. Uh, this was supposed to bring in others. Well, yes and no, you know, despite <clears throat> its softening uh, on bilateral relations, the Saudis haven't come in yet, but there's a lot more positive conversation from uh, Mohammed bin uh, Salman, MBS, about Israel than there ever was. Frankly, he even says Israel, I know, so what? But saying Israel and not saying the Zionist entity is actually, a, weirdly, a big deal. Uh, he allowed, um, uh, uh, I thought it was a dog coughing, where things got in the kennel cough. Um, you can't catch it through Zoom, don't worry. Um, he's, he's allowed Israeli planes to go over. Uh, he's, he's opened up a lot into the possibility of other normalizing relations, if not full-fledged normalization. So that is a big deal. Um, Adel al Juber, the Saudi Minister of State for Foreign Affairs, said that um, the Arab Peace Initiative uh, posits that peace comes at the end of the process, not at the beginning. That's huge. The API, the Arab Peace Initiative, used to have the Palestinians at the center and at the beginning. They always said, you do this first, and then we'll talk about regional cooperation, then we'll talk about diplomatic relations, then we'll talk about you know, um, uh, us traveling to Israel and Israeli traveling to us. So now uh, the Saudi minister of uh, state for foreign affairs said um, in a public forum, uh, the API, the Arab Peace Initiative says that peace comes at the end of the process, not at the beginning. That was unheard of even a few years ago, much less 10 or 20. Um, Gulf states like Oman and Qatar, um, uh, they've long maintained nearly de jure relations with Israel. Uh, they, they haven't followed the UAE yet, and Bahrain yet to formalize their ties, but it's closer. From an Israeli perspective, this incremental improvement in its links to the Arab Gulf states that might be sufficient. That might be, okay, we'll live with it. Yes, we want something more. We want, you know, the Israeli flag flying in every Arab capital. Uh, we want them over here and us over there and uh, further economic ties, who knows? But right now, the cessation of hostilities, that ain't too bad. And even a cold peace is better than a cold war or, or a warm war. Um, uh, so, so in Israel, this is seen as a, as a, as a net plus. Um, there's also security cooperation in the Red Sea uh, where the Saudis have demonstrated a willingness to work with Israel on the ground, the boots on the ground. Um, Egyptian military works with the Israeli military all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. here, uh, our, our daughter as a first lieutenant was a, a, a go-between with the Egyptian military and the Israeli uh, military, uh, extraordinary. Again, if you think about all that so many of us were raised on with the wars and the hostility, the enmity, to know that people are cooperating, uh, they don't love each other. Okay, I was gonna say this to the end, but um, when people say, oh, it'll never happen. Uh, so France and Germany, uh, they fought three wars, 18, 1870, 71, World War I, World War II, um, the worst, the worst um, enmity between nations and between peoples. Um, one interesting way to understand warfare or cultural differences is to look, there's a whole genre, to look at the songs developed during wars. It's fascinating. It's really amazing um, to look at the words people use the, the words that we used about the Vietnamese, you know, the dehumanizing words, all that, right? So the words that the French used about the Germans and vice versa, 
you couldn't get uglier and you couldn't get worse than the war they had for German unification. Um, uh, Dreyfus, Alfred Dreyfus was um, accused of selling secrets to the Germans, right? So Germany and France, Germany and France, Germany and France, three times in the space of, and now they're allies. They may still not love each other, uh, but they're allies. Um, our allies with the Japanese and with the Germans, right? Um, talk about names we use for each other during the war. Um, if if you were to come back all these, you know, uh, time travel movies, and you come back from World War II, uh, some of them are jokes, right? Uh, who's our our uh, our enemy? Russia. Wait, aren't they our allies? Who's who's our ally? Japan and Germany. What? And who's the president? Ronald Reagan. Because it's an old joke. Uh, I mean, it's just it turns the world on its head. So. It's just a way of saying that who knows? You can never, ever, ever be sure. Um, a couple other things, and then I want to uh, pause again, see if there's questions, and then go to, so where do we go from here? Oman and Qatar on the Gulf, um, they have a longstanding practical arrangement with Israel. Uh, Doha, the, the capital, <coughs> excuse me, of, of uh, uh, Qatar, um, criticized the Abraham Accords uh, at the beginning and reiterated its support for the Arab Peace uh, Initiative. And the Qatari government uh, maintained its working with Israel relationship under the radar. But both have softened in, in, even in the last couple of years. Um, right now, there's an Israeli participation in uh, an Omani Middle East Desalination Research Center, uh, which is interesting, the last of the Madrid conference proposals that's still around. The Madrid conference was in 1990 under Bush one. And we also thought that was, oh my God, the, the harbinger of a whole new era. That fell apart too. But one of the, the long lasting things was this desalination uh, research plan. And that's come into a, a third life uh, with Oman and Israel. Um, after two years, the Accords don't have a firm footing um, in the Arab street. They have a firmer footing in the Arab Leaders Council. So that's both good and not great. The Arab street has its own power. Uh, the Arab Spring, right, in 07 was supposed to turn things over. It didn't. Um, you know, Egypt, there was a, a revolution against uh, Hosni Mubarak. Um, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood didn't seem to like that, and they overturned that. Uh, you know, what happened in Tunisia and on and on. So the street doesn't necessarily have ultimate power. Look what's going on in Iran today. Not Arab, but the Muslim street, let's say. Um, there's a possibility that the street can sometimes have more power than the despotic leaders, sometimes not. But, but leaving that aside, the street still hasn't firmly embraced uh, the Accords, but they're just beginning to see some of the benefits. Uh, like every other country, you know, like uh, Chip O'Neill said, all politics is local. If the street feels um, uh, better in their own pocketbook because of the Accords, they might eventually get to seeing Israel through uh, a better lens. Um, uh, okay, so before we go to the future of the Accords, any other uh, questions or, yeah, David. So one one thing I don't think I heard you say, and if you said it, I apologize for, for missing it. Uh, one of the things one heard and, and read for a, a certain amount of time, at least in the not too distant past, is that the other issue between uh, the Gulf states and the and Saudi Arabia and other of the Arab countries and Iran is not only Sunni versus Shia, but also uh, Arab versus Persian. And that that also goes to some degree with Arab versus Turk, because yeah. Islam had its origin in amongst the Arabs. But the Arabs at one time or another historically have been dominated either by a Persian empire or a Turkish empire. And so there's also a, uh, a kind of ethnic dislike. So there's a religious dislike and an ethnic dislike. I don't know which is stronger. 
or whether that's relevant, but I, I, I'm just bringing it up because I don't think I heard you address that. No, I, I, thank you, David. It's a great point. Um, uh, I, I put together a, 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 a class a few years ago um, about the, the, the different parallel um, uh, um, dynamic tensions in the region. So cultural, historical, political, theological, and even linguistic. Uh, and, and, and ethnic, so I'm glad you raised it, right? So uh, Iranians are not Arab, they're Muslim, they are Persian. The other interesting thing, when you talk about the Turks, uh, ethnic Turks who are also Muslim, uh, Kamal Ataturk in the early part of the 20th century wanted to modernize the Turkish uh, um, empire, right? And it was the beginning of the, the run to nation states. Uh, and um, they dropped the Fez. Uh, they they adopted primarily because of uh, uh, Ataturk, a, um, a Western dress, uh, and um, they tried to use the, um, uh, the the English alphabet, not the Turkish alphabet. That's really turned on its head because of uh, Erdogan, not just, but because of Erdogan. The Turks and the Iranians also have oh, and the Egyptians also have something else going for them. They see themselves as the, the descendants of ancient proud empires. And I think this is really fascinating. Um, I'm working up a, an article for which I have no time uh, talking about the, uh, I think I came up with six um, uh, extant empires. And, and uh, I, um, the Turks are one, the Russians are another, um, uh, the Chinese are another. Even if they're not empiric today, they see themselves through the lens of their ancient empire. So the Iranians um, never used to use the word Persian. Now more and more it's creeping into their vocabulary. They're the inheritors of the great Persian empire. The Persians of course were before uh, uh, Muhammad and before Islam, but they see themselves as deserving more of the world. The Turks see themselves as the inheritors of the Ottoman empire. Um, so what's fascinating is that the three non-Arab, uh, most important non-Arab uh, nation states in the region, Turkey, Iran, and Israel, you would think they would have something more in common. They don't. So Turkey and Iran, both Muslim, but one is Turkish uh, ethnically, one is um, uh, really they were the original Aryans, and Aryan got a bad rap because of Germany. Uh, and they're Persian uh, historically. So, and even linguistically, Farsi instead of Arabic. So it, you're right. So on all of those levels, Iran plays its own game. There are other Shia countries, but it's the most powerful. So that, that's, a, that's an excellent point. Ethnically, they, they don't play nicely in the same sandbox with any of their neighbors. They do because they're afraid of them, but not because there's love there. Uh, Oh, I see, uh, Stephen, uh, your electronic hand is up. Yep, you've partially answered, begun to answer the question uh, I was going to pose about Turkey, the three countries, the three Muslim countries. Um, are there projections that analysts make um, as to this power struggle, um, who will prevail or who will be uh, come out as the strongest leading the Muslim world? And how, if at all, does India fit into this? Oh, wow, that's really interesting. Um, and, that, and that's another one of the empires uh, I, I'm putting in the article that I'm, I'm probably not gonna write, uh, the, the Hindu empire. I think it's, if you see it through the lens of these ancient empires, um, that's how they look. Uh, Americans, we see ourselves through our lens and other people see us through their lens, right? Uh, so these ancient empires, they go back, you know, um, millennia, literally, and they, you know, they, they see themselves through the pages uh, of uh, lost glory, and they think it's due them to recapture that. So India is fascinating. Let me see if I can get to that. The, um, uh, um, most analysts, I, I try to keep up on this, even though it's not a daily uh, a thing for me. Um, they're not sure that um, Khamenei um, uh, in Iran 
is going to be able to withstand the current protests. I, I think that's, well, obviously, that's a long, long conversation in and of itself. Um, the fact that the protests have gone on now for two months is pretty um, head scratching in and of itself. Um, probably, by most accounts, um, uh, 500, which is probably a small number, is probably undercounting, 500 dead in the street, um, hundreds and hundreds jailed, uh, and women, not solely women, but unbelievably brave women, are, are still literally burning their hijab. I, I, it's just mind boggling to think about that. Will they? Will there be enough to overturn, uh, you know, the modesty police and the uh, revolutionary guard? It seems highly unlikely, but other revolutions have happened before as well. Um, no one, no one thought the Shah was going to be toppled in, until the day he was. Uh, Khomeini was a joke until we all realized he wasn't. So who knows? Uh, uh, but. But that's the hope for genuine regime change. As far as you know, um, the more powerful the ascendant in in the nation, in in, in the region. Sorry, um, Egypt is not what it used to be. It's it's economically in really really uh, tough shape. The Saudis uh, are economically probably um, in the strongest shape. Militarily, they're they were untested until Yemen. Now they're tested and they haven't proved to be so great. They have hundreds of billions of dollars of American weapons at, at their disposal. Um, uh, they haven't proven to be as adept as they thought they were. Um, uh, so it's not as if they can you know, suggest that they're going to be ascendant militarily. And Iran also, because of the sanctions, uh, is not nearly as strong as they would like. The difference though is Iran does have a whole different infrastructure and they've been sending out their, their, their proxy warriors in four Arab uh, Sunni nations um, and have longer tentacles, not just in those nations, but in Hamas and Hezbollah. I agree with uh, Bibi Netanyahu um, that they are a threat, um, if not an existential threat, let's say a serious grave critical threat to Israel and to, to the region. Uh, so there, you know, right, right now it would be hard to say who is really ascendant militarily. Israel, you know, by all uh, uh, matrices has the, the strongest, certainly not the largest, but the strongest military and the most effective. Um, so there is a bit of a, of a standstill there. Uh, any other? Yes, Sheila. Um, you just, I, this is not the question I wanted to ask originally, but uh, if Israel is so strong, and I think that one of the factors that they're coming to make peace is that, uh, you know, if they need Israel against Iran, she's there. Now, the question is if Israel helps them win any kind of war, God, I mean, God forbid there is a war, would they not resent Israel? Right. So, so actually, that's a great segue. I, I, I looked at um, the AJC, the American Jewish Committee, um, held an unbelievable forum, a global forum, um, <clears throat> just a couple of months ago, uh, at which the Israeli ambassador to the UN, the Bahraini ambassador, the Moroccan ambassador, and the uh, Emirati ambassador to the UN all participated in a panel. Once again, um, we can't take that stuff for granted. Well, I mean, in a way, maybe it's good to take good news for granted, uh, but in a way, we we actually never should. So the the idea, the picture of uh, a panel with the uh, UN ambassador of the UAE, Morocco, um, uh, Bahrain, and Israel sitting next to each other uh, and chatting in between uh, uh, the the uh, the interviewers' questions, mind blowing. So I, I looked at the um, transcripts from this uh, uh, this global forum. The consensus is that, and I'll, because this leads to your your question, Sheila. Number one, the consensus uh, among all four is that U.S. leadership is essential. 
even more than that, it's essential for moving forward. The Arab states all unanimously say we need Americans' proactive role, that even if Israel could do something, we actually need the Americans to take that step if uh, Iran has to be taken out, right? Uh, what, whatever phrase you want, uh, attack its nuclear reactor uh, uh, sites um, uh, destroyed. Um, if Israel does it, this may be what you were um, implying, um, it's going to be hell to pay uh, in the Muslim world and in the Arab world. If the Americans do it, they'll still be hell to pay, but it'll be a different kind of hell. So in some way, uh, the Arab states don't want Israel to do that because it'll allow the Arab street to say, see, you know, see your buddy Israel, look what they did to another Muslim state. So it's better to, uh, to have the Americans uh, do it. So it's complicated. They can cozy up to Israel, but, but we're still not at that place where even if Israel does something that most in the Arab world want it to do, it's still not going to be a comfortable partnership. Um, uh, we just had this. Yeah. Th there was an article about Jordan and Israel. They're trying to make some kind of agreement about water. Jordan is absolutely desperate, yeah. but the Palestinians don't want the water from Israel. They need it. They have 36 right. hours a week of water. And, uh, I think there is an agreement that's actually been signed, but yeah, look, uh, it, the Palestinians <clears throat> again. It's it's almost the classic uh, uh, definition of a description of cutting off our nose to spite our face. Right. Which, by the way, doesn't translate well when you when you uh, use uh, an idiom like that in another language. They look at you like I once uh, tried to translate throw the baby out with the bathwater in Hebrew, and I thought they were going to arrest me. So uh, cutting off our nose despite our face is an awful thing, but we know what it means. Yeah, Palestinians, right. For, uh, look, not only the Palestinians, we're, we're all suspect uh, to that. Uh, in, in March, just a few months ago, uh, uh, Secretary of State Blinken invited participants um, uh, to the Negev summit in Israel to further expand their ties to each other. So once again, the, uh, the Emirati, the Moroccan, the Sudanese, and the the um, uh, the Bahraini uh, representatives all came to to the Negev to talk about multilateral regional cooperation and working groups. Um, the UAE ambassador um, praised Blinken's participation and said, "The U.S. is the preferred partner for this region. It is a long-standing partner." In in the Atlantic, just a few months ago, Crown Prince uh, uh, MBS said, "We do not view Israel as an enemy, but rather." as a potential ally. Uh, so I had to dig around to get a good quote, but I thought, wow. Um, and I fact checked myself to make sure it was right. So MBS, the incoming king or the de facto king, don't worry about that, said, we do not view Israel as an enemy, but rather as a potential ally. Um, all politics is local again. Even dictators have to worry about um, uh, local politics. Um, the fact that MBS could say that and not worry, maybe he does worry, but not worry too much about the clerics in Saudi Arabia is huge. Uh, so for him to say that we see Israel as a potential ally, that's another step when the, when the Palestinians or the Middle East Institute criticize the Abraham Accords by saying, it's not going anywhere, there won't be any other partners, I'm not so sure. For the Saudis to be able to say that, that's a, that's a big deal. Um, there are also reports of clandestine <clears throat> um, contact between Israel and the, and the Saudis lately, um, based on mutual concerns about Iran. Uh, but again, spillover effect can go from that to something more. President Biden also signed something called the Jerusalem Declaration recently, saying that the US is committed to building a robust regional architecture to deepen the ties between Israel and all of its regional partners, to advance Israeli uh, regional integration over time, and to expand the circle of peace to include ever more Arab and Muslim states. So very rare, uh, nearly everything I can think of off the top of my head 
from the Trump administration to the Biden administration, President Biden um, tried to overturn, and much of what he was trying to overturn was itself overturned during the Trump administration, except this. I think this is the, the only major policy piece where President Biden didn't only not want to overturn it, he actually wanted to build upon it and expand it. So I suppose that's got to mean something in the universe. If there's one thing that these two administrations agree, and it's this, uh, it probably won't happen again, but I, I think that says something. Um, uh, okay. Um, interestingly, uh, Ambassador Nuseba from the UAE said that the accords are not only an agreement between countries, but he said between Islam and Judaism. That lifts it to a whole different um, uh, uh, level of uh, understanding as well. The peace dividend, this is what the Arab street, the Arab leaders are calling it, the peace dividend is sold if the tangible and practical benefits that we see in the UAE, that we see in Bahrain and Morocco and Israel are felt in a wider circle of Arab and in Muslim countries. Uh, and the Moroccan ambassador said, the Abraham Accords were not an end in itself, but a trigger for better Middle East. So, so in general, the Arab ambassadors uh, representing their countries, the hope is that it'll increasingly engage the region's youth, which is a vast demographic bubble. Um, the Middle East is one of the areas where the under 30 year olds, the um, unemployed under 30 year olds, which is a dangerous demographic, um, is reaching 40% in some cases. Very scary if you study any any um, international relations or war history. That's that's the, the place where demographically you look for trouble spots. Young and unemployed. They got time in their hands. They got hormones in their bodies. They got to go kick down some doors, and you can you can lead them, you know, uh, uh, and and manipulate them. So the hope is that in the Arab uh, countries that economically, if we can bring, you know, literally bread, water, food, sustenance, and jobs to this uh, underemployed and unemployed youth demographic, that's gonna be the source of, yet again, the uh, spillover. Um, Ambassador Nusaber from the UAE said, if we widen the circle of peace, we can add a trillion dollars over the next decade and take them away from the path of extremism. So, the, the 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 negative perspective. Uh, I'll do this. Uh, oh, six thirty, eight thirty. Okay. Let me let me pause. There's just a few other things I want to wrap up, but see if there's any other uh, questions or comments people want to make. Okay. All right. So so um, let me think. There's um, here. Why, why is this different from the 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 first rash of of uh, peace accords, um, 79 with Egypt, 94 with Jordan, 95 with the, the, PL, uh, the PLO and, and uh, Arafat and, and the handshake uh, uh, on the White House lawn. Um, that time was a time when we thought, <clears throat> so at the beginning, it was like I suggested, state to state uh, during the, the what we call the liberation war, War of Independence, what the Arab Street still calls the Nakbar, the catastrophe, but the 47-48 war was about state to state. There was a, a, a contingent of Palestinian fighters, but very, very small. Um, then 56 was uh, Egypt, and uh, I hate doing Middle East history just by the wars, but it's shorthand. Uh, 56 was the Sinai campaign, uh, Egypt and Israel and France and, and, uh, and the UK, uh, 67, of course, again, were, were state to state uh, actors. Um, after 67, the PLO was a bit transcendent, uh, uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, Arafat uh, grew in stature and said, the, the nation states aren't doing it for us. We have to dig in our heels. And that was the era where um, terrorism became even more pronounced uh, hijackings, kidnappings, um, terrible, terrible assaults uh, in Israel and around the world. 73, of course, was Egypt and Syria um, regaining their national um, uh, pride. Uh, and then again, it was state to state. After that, 
it really uh, became an era of non-state uh, actors being transcendent. And uh, and the 90s was still that. That's why the PLO was such a big deal. The difference now between then is that even though there is a Palestinian authority, of course, and Hamas and Hezbollah and other non-state actors, it's really back to the, the realm of state to state. And the state leaders need to, to quell the rebellion or potential rebellion in their street. When you're a non-state actor, you have no territory or you, you're holding on to a bit of territory. You don't have to act the same as the Saudi monarch, as the, um, uh, the president of even Syria, as the prime minister of other countries. You have different worries. So the state to state um, uh, actions, I think make sense because they have to bring a peace dividend to their people. The people who are complaining, when you wanna look at, at what's going on with a treaty uh, or any relationship, look at the people who are upset. So who are the ones who are most upset with the Abrahamic Accords? The Palestinians, um, the Iranians who play a different role, Hezbollah and Hamas, um, these are the people who have less to lose um, and they have less to gain. The people who are happy are the one nation state actors um, because they're the ones with the most to gain during this uh, and, and they have much more uh, skin in the game. Um, finally, uh, Biden at the, uh, in the 2020 elections praised these accords, uh, promised not to uh, reverse policy. And like I said, not only was he fully committed to the policy, he was fully committed to expanding cooperation in the region. And as I suggested, I believe that the, one of the few times at the only time praised President Trump by name uh, because of, of what the Abraham Accords might bring to the region. Oh, one last thing. This is very Biden-esque, uh, where for President Trump, it was an uh, example of transactional diplomacy. President Biden, love him, don't love him, whatever. He's, he's a man, I, I believe, of pragmatic, practical, step-by-step. -step. Some would call it plotting. Some would call it, you know, um, logical. But he's somebody who doesn't believe, uh, I'm, I'm generalizing, but doesn't believe in the grand um, a strategy, right? Um, his thought in the Middle East is not to I'm going to make peace between the Palestinians, whether it is Arabs and the Israelis. Every president I can think of tried to do that, and every president got stuck in the quicksand. The really smart ones and ones who weren't so smart. The ones full of commitment, the ones full of the Bible, and the ones not. Every single one got stuck. The difference with President Biden is he wants one step that leads to the next that leads to the next. Again, I'm generalizing. This thing is actually tailor-made for him. What he wants, I, I believe, we don't talk so often, so I don't know what he wants, but <laughs> what I think he wants is, all right, there's four Arab nations. Um, who's got the fifth? Uh, let's see how that works, and where's the sixth? I think this this step-by-step, in a way, way, it's an echo of Kissinger, step-by-step uh, step, uh, you know, uh, uh, diplomacy. In a weird way, it fits the Trump administration because it's transactional and the Biden administration because it's step-by-step -step practical and pragmatic. There's an article in there someplace that I probably won't write again. Anyway, last uh, comment, Sheila. Um, what, what, what nobody discusses is because of this peace pact with the Abraham Accords, um, the Jews who left these countries who were chased out probably will drop any claims to any land. In other words, some of them I think wanted to claim land. I mean, they we've always said, you know, the Palestinians are, are yelling at us that we stole their land, but the fact that that we had to leave all the Arab countries, or some people had to leave Yemen and, and uh, Saudi Arabia and all those countries. Well, that we get compensation, right? Well, this so, could also quiet them down. Yeah, and 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 to their credit, the the Moroccans, like I said, um, are trying to uh, make yeah, it very comfortable are. and worthwhile for Moroccan Jews not to reclaim land, but to come visit 
you know, it has amazing Jewish history. It's one of the, the Arab countries I've, I've wanted to go to forever because it's got amazing Jewish history in it. So, uh, I, yeah, I think there's some, something to that. Anyway, I know we've gone over. Thank you so much. Uh, the Thank last you. class, we're going to talk about the, the broad scheme, Israel relations with America, with Russia, with China, uh, and with the European Union. You can't write it too early, you know. No, no kidding. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Jerry. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.